my name is James Lefanu. I am I've been in general practice for 20 years. I write a regular medical column for the Daily Telegraph once a week. The only way out of this is what I call the patient's revolt. People have just got to stop believing. Just, you know, they just have to go to their doctor, you know. That, and it, actually, that's more, a more direct way and say, you know, why, why am I taking all these pills? What's going on here? Um, and um, and, and um, so that's the first point. Uh, I mean, that, that, that is my... That's where I see it coming to, coming to a halt. I don't see, because the problem is that there are so many guidelines, there are so many nice this and that, and all that sort of thing. Nobody's going to turn around and say, um, well, actually, I think we've made a mistake about this, and, you know, we don't think that everybody over the age of um, uh, you know, 32 should be on statins. There's a very good um, Norwegian phrase for it, which is getting your feet stuck in the piano wire. And the trouble is you can't disentangle your feet from the piano wire without making a noise. And you can't disentangle us from the problems of overdiagnosis and overtreatment without making a noise. This is a really interesting phenomenon that um, this problem, what I call systemic or systematic iatrogenesis, as opposed to you give somebody a pill, he has an idiot, you know, he has some unfortunate side effect from it, that sort of thing. Systematic is when it is, as it were, part of mainstream practice. And of course, the damage which comes from that is vastly greater than the individual doctor making a mistake or prescribing the wrong drug. My real insight is that I, I write this medical column for the Daily Telegraph once a week. It comes out every Monday. But I get this enormous correspondence. People write and tell me the story of their lives, and very interesting they are too. Um, and the great and the recurring theme for the last 10 years has been this terrible problem about being overtreated uh, for illnesses that they don't have uh, and, you know, and the consequences. And of course, it's a fascinating insight because actually, this is an almost unique resource because, you know, you hear doctors' opinions and you hear critics' opinions, but actually, the, you know, the people who are experiencing it you know, they are, you know, relatively unheard of, you know, or at least their voice is relatively silent. And I actually, I did a little audit of the, uh, of women over 80 in our practice. 40% of whom were taking statins. You know, absolutely preposterous. And then when you went through their notes, it was really interesting. They were complaining about things which nobody had really taken any notice of. And what? They were complaining about taking too many pills. They were complaining about um, taking too many pills. They were complaining about side effects, symptoms which were quite least side effects related to their polypharmacy and all that sort of thing. Um, and nobody had taken any notice of it. And this is a really good practice. You know, and the point is that unless one starts from the principle of understanding why it is, that you shouldn't be giving statins to people over the age of 75, unless you realize that, you know, it is a default position. You have to have a really, really good reason to prescribe it. Um, then you're not going to, um, then, they're, then they're going to be prescribed and you're going to have all these problems. The whole point about mass medicalization and particularly the preventive mass medicalization is that it is not based on a, on a, on a a knowledge base of which they have any personal direct experience, you know. And indeed, you know, they can't have any experience because I would doubt there's a single doctor in the country who, who is not medically, statistically trained, who understands the, ma the mathematical algorithms on which these things are based. Because it's quantitated, then therefore it must be true. It is this delusion that you know that you believe that only only statistically based knowledge is reliable and so on. Um, and you know my experience is that statistically based knowledge is not reliable. A classic example of that 
is the um, you know, 2008 crash. You know, that was based on a mathematical algorithm um, of which everybody knew couldn't possibly be true, that you could sell people bum mortgages and somehow repackage them and sell them on. But, you know, it was mathematically demonstrable. Uh, uh, and, you know, it was, you know, there was an algorithm and you could put <laughs> and as a result, you know, you know, um, the uh, American economy, uh, you know, lost a trillion dollars. A classic example of this was, um, and it's from some time ago, but was the advice that after you'd had a coronary, you should be in bed for ten, six weeks to allow the muscle to heal, the heart muscle to heal. And this, rep, this, this advice was promulgated in the 1930s. And um, it was so self-evident that um, they never used to do it, really. Even though the patients were sitting in their beds for six weeks, you know, becoming very dispirited, developing bed sores, becoming constipated, getting out of bed and falling over, um, having pulmonary emboli and dying. And it was so manifestly, you know, wrong thing, but it had so many, many adverse effects. Um, until um, in the Second World War, when they were the bombing of London, the Blitz, there was an incredible demand on hospital beds, you know, because everybody had to go somewhere. And uh, one, of the, one of the physicians said, well, you know, We've got to put these patients somewhere. You know, let's change this from, you know, have to have six weeks bed rest to two weeks bed rest. And all these problems started, you know, before their eyes started evaporating. You know, they didn't get bed sores, they didn't get pulmonary emboli and so on and so on. And the really fascinating thing about that is that it was so, the reason for the the recommendation, and of course the consequences, well, I mean, goodness knows what the mortality rate must have been from, you know, constant, you know ad, of prolonged bed rest. Um, that despite the amazing adverse consequences, nonetheless, everybody thought they were doing the right thing, and it was self-evidently the case. And the comparison with this current situation with polypharmacy and overdiagnosis is, you know, it's just, it's, you know, it's absolutely manifest. Everybody thinks they're doing a good thing, prescribing all these pills, stopping all these people getting strokes and heart attacks, theoretically, on the basis of obscure mathematical algorithms that they don't understand. <laughs> they, don't, they don't see the fact before their eyes that their patients are having all these adverse effects and that it is completely intolerable that you should, you know, be taking eight pills a day, uh, eight different medications a day, and so on and so on. And it's a really fascinating thing about, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a sense of perception and what it is and how difficult it is to change that, you know? And what changed it for bed rest was the blitz. And, you know, one feels that somehow or other a similar <laughs> you know, monumental catastrophe is going to happen in order to change it for, you know, change the situation away from mass medicalization. But I don't know.